Good evening, everyone. I am glad to be a part of this uh, Principles 101 training. I wish I had some of this information available to me when I was a uh, first-time superintendent, supporting my educators along their journey as uh, as uh, principal teachers. And so I'd just like to just share uh, with you here. Um, let me just, okay. Uh, just a few things, some of which I'm sure are not unfamiliar to you. It has to do with um, things related to safety, school statutes, policies, practices. I'll try to go very fast because it's actually um, a long presentation. Um, so I'll try to do it in 10 minutes uh, or fewer if I can. Um, of course, because we are in local parentis as educators, we have a duty, a responsibility to protect the vulnerable who are our students um, in, in our care, whether we, they are on field trips, whether they are in the building, um, whether it's um, something outside of our control, like a weather um, emergency or whatever the case might be, whether it's um, an activity that we are engaged in. We always are thinking of the student's safety. Um, whether it has to do with the ratio of students to teachers, um, students to teachers on a field trip, needing the number of chaperones, making sure that we have those ratios appropriate to the level, age level that's being um, chaperoned um, or supervised, whether it has to be the type of transportation and who's driving and all of the protocols, conference requirements, Office of Education requirements in terms of paperwork, approved drivers and their driving record, all of those things. And when it comes to overnight activities, special care also, sometimes these field trip forms go through the board meetings very quickly. And sometimes because they're so frequent, oftentimes attention, uh, questions are not asked or due diligence um, is not paid to the details, who's chaperoning, where will the kids stay, um, well, the transportation, the driving record of the um, persons. Now, of course, once they are pre-approved um, by the board, then that's um, that, that makes it much easier. Um, however, those intermediary checks can always be because I can get three tickets in between my last approval, right? Driving tickets, that is, um, because maybe I have some change in my driving habits or whatever the case might be. And then, of course, uh, when it comes to mandatory reporting, we know very well um, that we are mandatory reporters. And of course, the question is, can a substitute teacher serve as a mandatory reporter if they are substituting for, um, my, for me if I'm outside of the classroom? Uh, they are in local parentis in my absence, right? And so they have that, that responsibility. And of course, uh, mandatory reporters are those who are required by law to report reasonable and suspicious abuse um, and uh, there are a number of persons who fall in that category. You could see from the list here, um, social workers, you can get that information on childwelfare.gov and the list is here. You could see for yourself and the number of persons. So pastors too are mandatory reporters. So, All right, um, some examples of classroom negligence. Um, They'd be thinking about that as we go through this. Um, that could happen as you're teaching in the classroom. That could happen when you excuse a student to go to the bathroom or two students inadvertently to go to the bathroom because I may have forgotten that I sent another student out. And so two students are in the bathroom simultaneously, uh, whether it's on a field trip or on the playground. But what is negligence? Negligence is duty plus reasonable, reasonable care. If there's a damage that's involved, that's reasonably foreseeable, right? So if I have a duty, did I perform reasonable care? Was there damage? Somebody got hurt? And is that injury, what could that injury have been foreseen? Uh, maybe um, a mat that was folded over or, or flipped over and somebody falls, hurts themselves. So you can see the definition there for negligence. Now, um, some questions to think about as it pertains to supervision is one of the easiest ones to slip through our fingers as educators, right? Because we are busy with teaching, we're multitasking, et cetera. But did I notice that um, Johnny slipped out of the classroom and went somewhere, wandering down the hallway, whatever the case might be? Or that did I see that Jason 
jabbed another student um, or tripped another student. Did I see that? Do we have, you know, sometimes I always tell my, my teachers, we've got to have those eyes like ESP, extrasensory perception. So we kind of know what's happening behind our backs or wherever we might be. We have a sense of the dynamics of the of this classroom situation. Um, do I know that my computers and the iPads and the, the Chromebooks that I provide, are they safe? And am I checking them uh, to know what my students are being exposed to? And then in, as the matter, in the matter of harassment, you have the different categories, bullying, hazy, hazing, cyberbullying, grooming, electronic stalking, and the variety, and the list goes on and on. How attentive and how knowledgeable is my staff um, to, to these types of harassments? And then there's hacking, sexting, phishing, and more, which I'm sure you're familiar with. In the interest of time, I'll, I won't spend much time discussing those in any detail, but let's talk a little bit about recess safety. And um, what does your conference outline or risk management for that matter outline as prohibited material um, or equipment that should not be used at a school because if a student gets injured, the injury would not be covered by your student accident insurance or by um, the student health insurance or whatever the case may be, but certainly by the school's um, insurance. So you can get that information, talking with your board, your superintendent, et cetera. So recess safety is really important. This was actually a live shot that I took at one of my schools when I was superintendent. Um, and that was a prohibited, um, uh, uh, prohibited. And so of course you come as a superintendent and you see these things and you give guidance to the school. I think um, I recognize that school. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering. <laughs> um, then when it comes to recreational activities, um, what is what is listed under the conference's liability? So what's acceptable? What will the, conference, the school uh, student insurance cover? So be thinking about those things. Excluded recreational activities. You can see the list here. Tackle football, go-karts, fireworks, skateboarding, climbing walls. And I know that at camp, there's climbing walls and it's sometimes repelling, but just have to make sure that whatever um, that you, the insurance covers those at schools. Um, if it happens at camp, if there's an exclusion for camp, you wanna make sure that if it's, it, it's covered for school as well, if it's not covered for the school or for the gymnasium, then we can't do it at school. So um, take care of this list here. Um, inspections are very helpful in that they can be preventative. And um, you should all have an emergency flip chart and emergency manuals and manual in your school um, that you can provide training for your students and your staff periodically. It's not, it, should, it shouldn't be put on the shelf. It should be all. And you should have the signals in place. Should there be a tornado or an intruder, God forbid, or something that needs to um, bring attention to the entire school a student body um, about. And then, of course, the, the inspection checklist, not only at the time when we're getting ready for accreditation visits, right? We got to make sure that we keep up with these um, in school inspection checklists. Um, things get old, um, um, fire um, hydrants get outdated. And, um, and so we certainly want to make sure everything's in place as far as that is concerned. I'm going to just go through, not read these. Um, this is a very fascinating um, case study, actually, um, uh, about a broken equipment um, and the legal terminology that's used for um, a neighborhood kids comes and um, swings on the broken swing or the merry-go-round, but it's broken. The board knows it's been broken. They're trying to raise money for it, but it's broken. It's an attractive nuisance. How do you keep kids away from a swing set or a merry-go-round? Um, so, um, even so, whatever the case might be. So, I'm going to skip through that in the interest of time. All right. And then your drills are so important. And not only the fire drills, which need to be recorded per conference policy or um, um, tornado drills, but also your lockdown drills with local law enforcement input, who can really be helpful in giving ideas as to best place to hide or whatever the exit or whatever the case might be. Administration of medication, the routine things sometimes we take can are likely to take for granted, but where do we store the medication? How do we get permission to administer medication? What kind of medication should or could be administered? What should we have on site at the school um, for the new illnesses that have been emerging, like EpiPens, et cetera? And what are the statutes pertaining to those? 
One of the uh, recently there was a situation where there was an injury that was reported far after, long after it had taken days after it had taken place, right? No, excuse me, hours, many hours at the end of the day. Injury, parents should know right away. And um, then you go down the line, poor conference guidelines, right? So there are times when, depending on the injury, you need to call your superintendent. If it's a bru bruise or a cut, not necessary, right? But parents should always be informed. But there are certain things that rise to the level of your principal, of course, but then your superintendent being aware of certain things for your conference policies. And I know all conferences go through you, um, go through their guidelines with you. So just know um, the reporting protocols for your conference and uh, for your school. And please um, keep an eye on your student accident insurance application, be familiar with it because things happen and know how you can secure that. Um, of course, be familiar with your, whatever county or village that your school is locating, located in, know what the warning signals sound like, right? If it's a tornado or a tornado warning, be familiar with that in your school. Is If it's a television or the beep beep on your phone, whatever the case might be, um, whatever the warning protocols are um, for your area where your school is located. And um, health alerts, for example, there's lice, a situation of lice or some sort of a rare fever that is highly contagious. How how do we communicate with our families and what is the what are the protocols? And your conference typically outlines those uh, for you. And then of course, if your school is used as a public a polling a polling location, what are the guidelines? What are you, what's your conference? Um, stipulating as to whether schools can be used. I know in some cases, some schools are used as uh, polling centers. And uh, what are the guidelines? Where do the parents enter? Do they enter through the same, excuse me, where do the students enter for school on those days? Is it the same entrance as a general public if the school is used as a polling station? So if it's used, um, it's a church school situation and there's a funeral and you have a lot of people um, who are unrelated to the school, you know, what are the e exits and uh, entrances and egresses, et cetera. So be familiar with that. Of course, the firearm laws, depending on your state, need being posted at the schools. Um, and I'm assuming that's for every state. Then of course, the forms that parents need to fill out um, if they don't mind the students' pictures being seen on the school's website um, or at a church program where you're showcasing the events of the day, so then making sure that parents sign sign off on those types of um, exposure, public exposure of their of their child. Um, sexual harassment, of course, um, that happens not just with adults, but also could happen with adult and student. It happens all the time in our schools, right? When I said all the time, I mean it does happen in our schools. Last year, there were cases of that, not in our like union schools that I'm aware of, but in our NAD schools. So these are things that are happening, uh, whether between student and parent, excuse me, student and teacher or teacher on teacher, whatever the case might be. All right, let's trans let's segue into um, what are the official documents? I think my time is wrapping up here of the school. They're right here, the school handbook. Um, Parent, the constitution and bylaws, the minutes of those are all official documents of the school. And there may be more depending on the size of your school or the category, um, elementary, secondary, whatever the case might be. All right, are there limitations on student expression? Um, what students can write, what they can't write, their artwork, their speech, their postings on social media. Certainly you'll get guidance of, um, um, on that from your conference or your school board, whatever um, whatever the protocols might be for your for your conference. Um, how about the teacher's expression? How sometimes teachers go ver get very detailed about their personal business, <laughs> and sometimes students may feel uncomfortable and may come home and talk to their parents about it. And the principal may need to have a conversation with the with the with the teacher. So appropriateness is also important. Child custody matters. Um, um, who can pick up the kid? Well, it, what does the document say? Um, and you got to go with the document when it comes to child custody matters. Very, very, we got to read the document, read the court order. Very, very important. How about tax con contribution? Um, excuse me, tuition contribution. Is that tax deductible? 
Yes, it is if it doesn't have a student name assigned to it. But once you put Ruth Horton's name <laughs> as the student who's going to benefit Mrs. Bond from that um, thousand dollar tuition donation, <laughs> oops, it's no longer a tax deduction. So certainly check with your conference HR and uh, um, conference superintendent on these guidelines. So, um, but certainly outside of the prohibitions as far as tax deductions or tax deduction um, deductible receipts, uh, then you you should be good. Bottom line is labor cannot be exchanged for tuition. So I'm going to clean, you know, the school uh, da 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 in exchange for tuition. That's a no no, right here. So more sexual harassment information here. I'm going to go through that. And then employment matters, right? So the things that our new employees have to go through, their, all of the HR paperwork for their own safety and the safety of the students. But we have a responsibility to provide safe working conditions. Um, no, if we have mold in the school or in the classroom, that's not only unsafe for the students, it's unsafe for the employee as well, right? And of course, those teacher evaluation documents, I can't say enough about them. That paperwork and that paper trail, as busy work as it may seem in some cases, but it really isn't. It's really a documentation that really helps the teacher in, in many ways. So if you're a teaching principal, whatever your conference protocols are, they may determine, well, teaching principals are not required to do evaluations, just full-time principals. It depends on what your conference's guidelines are as it pertains to that. But these documents are very, very important once they're written, the superintendent reviews them, or if the superintendent is writing them, that stays in the Office of Education. Um, very important. Um, employer's prerogative to assign. You know, pastors get moved around, right? But teachers typically don't get moved around. <laughs> uh, and that's a good thing in some cases. But sometimes you may need to move somebody around depending on the situation, or you may be moved, um, need to be moved around as an employee. So just that you're aware that the conference has the prerogative as it pertains to assigning and reassigning to different locations. So just know what the conference's guidelines are in reference to that. All right, um, some of the employee documents that the conference has on file, um, the working agreement, the handbook of educational policies and procedures, and also the HR documents. And then when it comes to dis disciplining and termination, there are some guidelines that guide this, whether you are a one-year, two-year, three-year employee, um, or whether you are on regular status, um, there are still some guidelines that pertain to that and your conference We'll give, um, we're always looking to ensure that there's due process and uh, whether you are one to three employee, that it's fair, that it's balanced and that there's due process. We always as employees wanna do the right thing, but just needing to be aware of that and, and what the conference's guidelines are. All right, as far as discipline, I'm gonna go through that. This is a really neat scenario here as to whether this situation warrants um, the, the employee says, you can't fire me. And so the question is, what legal right does the conference have in this situation? And time does not allow for me to read this case scenario. And then um, discrimination or non-discrimination policy. That's kind of, that's a policy we used to have to sign off on at the conference level and send it on to the NAD as we, um, but there may be other ways that the conference does that now. How about immigration, immigrant students, right? Um, how do we enroll them? What do we provide for them so that they can have a successful learning experience? We have a responsibility to all of the learners that we choose to accept in our schools. Exceptional learners or special education, uh, we do accept exceptional learners in our schools, but we want to be sure that we can provide for their needs as well. Just so you know, we have support for you in that regard. Um, we have a newly hired um, uh, Dr. Um, Wadzi, so she'll call her name, Wadzanai Beppe. She's a new any, um, Lake Union um, special education coordinator and, ex and instructional coach for the Lake Union. So you'll have support. She's going to firstly be your support as teachers in this specific area of special ed and then also as instructional coach. All right, so um, IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Act, be familiar with that. Some terms you should know as it pertains to students with, with exceptionalities, um, which is really important. The, five, the IEPs, you already know this, the 504 plan, the ITP, et cetera. 
right? Student disciplines, knowing who can suspend, uh, who who can who's who can suspend, who can expel. Those are not the two same bodies. Can a principal suspend? Sure. Can a principal expel? No. The board it has holds that responsibility. So just know what the process is for your conference and for your um, school. So you talked about student expression, record keeping. Oh, I can't say enough about keeping good records, whether it's classroom records of a student or in a teaching principal's case, in just things that are happening in your school with parents, with even with faculty and with student behavior, of course. Transfer of record. We do not allow for the transfer of records to go between the school and the parent and the new school. It goes from school to school. Records go from school to school. Parents do not take the records to the, to the new school. So just keep that in mind. Social security numbers. Um, we're trying to um, make sure that they're not on any legal forms anymore, um, any forms, not how social security. Then I skip through that. FUPA, Federal Family Education Rights and Privacy Act. Um, what, uh, what are the parents' rights? It's important for us as principal teachers, um, teaching principals to know what these are. Who has access to a student's records? Um, can the board chair come and ask? I heard recently about the board chair wanting a student's record. No, not unless it's that the board chair's son or daughter is enrolled at that school. So there are certain persons, but can the police ask for a student record? It depends, you know, it depends on the situation. Um, so how do, do we, what does your state say? I know like in Illinois, for example, you keep the records for 60 years for the permanent records, not the temporary, the permanent records. You're knowing what constitutes permanent records, what constitutes temporary records. And that's important. Report cards very important. And now we have dashboard and so we have electronic copies. But if if, if the computer goes down, then what's, what's your paperwork? So I know many of our schools, as a matter of fact, we did send out some QM folders just recently. Um, and so having that paper record is not a bad idea as well. Okay, Christian standards and lifestyle according to your handbook, according to your conference policies. Those are really important to keep in mind as a matter of safety and legal responsibility as employees. Of course, your suicide prevention policy, do we have some guidelines on grief and loss? That's really important. A parent passes away, a student passes, passes away. Uh, we've had all of those last school year. Um, so um, what is our policy and guideline in, in pertaining to that? Um, church and school entanglement, I, that was referenced earlier. <laughs> I know I've taught in a classroom that was also a Sabbath school room. <laughs> and um, that sometimes can be uncomfortable, um, but just knowing how to work smoothly with our for church partners. Bottom line is let's work at the lowest level to resolve issues and not allow mountains to be, more hills to become mountains. So let's do our best to handle um, issues at the lowest level. Because with God, all things are possible. Matthew chapter 19, verse 26. Wishing you a very successful school year.